So it's August of 84, uh, you're about to present your 84 budget. Uh, Labor was flying high. Yep. Bob Hawke hears from doctors via Hazel that their daughter Rosalind uh, has become a heroin addict as she's preparing uh, to have her first child. Mm. You were one of the first people uh, that Bob Hawke told. What was your emotional reaction? How did you identify with his emotional upheaval? Yeah. Well, the common point of identification is the fact that in a public life, families suffer. It's just the way, <clears throat> the way it is, the demands on your time. And all of us feel bad about that. But Bob always felt bad about the demands upon him and the fact that he wasn't able to give the kids uh, the time he would have liked. I think that then the news compounding itself on that, that one of the children has a really large problem uh, of this kind, you know, really probably compounded the impact of it. In the middle of his grief, uh Hawke called an election mm. with a long campaign and in the course of the campaign uh, on a radio network he promised a tax summit yeah. and that took you by surprise did it not? It did yeah because I'd spoken to him earlier that morning Peter Barron was then his minder Peter said look we're in South Perth motel or whatever it is and Bob's in room six so I give him a ring so I ring and say look the big issue today will be the capital gains tax you know uh, this stuff's out and about, and you're doing a talkback radio, so you better have your guard up about it. But meaning, meaning what? That, that uh, even though you guys were privately <coughs> thinking about a, Nash, a, a capital gains tax in your next term, you certainly didn't want it out there in the campaign. Yeah, and we hadn't decided anything about it, but the Liberals were trying to put it onto us as they had in 1980, when Peter Walsh had made ref references to it during Bill Hayden's campaign in 1980, and it was very detrimental to the Labor Party at that time. Yeah, and I said, I said, so Bob, you've got to be pretty weary of this. But look, these are the points, and I'd run through the points. Um, but then this tax summit issue just appears out of nowhere. After the election, <coughs> you and your department had to then plunge into preparations for yeah. a tax summit that would presumably produce a template for significant tax reform. Briefly, can you take me through the intensity of that process? Yeah, from a coal start, it was a massive amount of work. Like, for instance, the cafeteria of the Treasury, the downstairs daily cafeteria was all emptied out. And installed in there were the people who were doing the white paper. And where were you in all that? Oh, in and out of it all the time. In and out of it all, all the time. So when did the consumption tax really start to take shape for you? When did you become a convert? Well, when, when, um, uh, when Bob and I more or less agreed we'd have a, a tax on consumption in the mix. That would have been probably in early '85. But when did you become married to it? Well, the, it was, you see, Commonwealth government spending had risen from 23 and a half percent of outlays before Whitlam took office to 30 and a half percent when Howard and Fraser finished. They'd risen by seven percent of GDP, and because the Razor Gang episodes in the past had failed the famous one under Treasurer Phil Lynch, the Treasury had no confidence that we would ever cut government spending. And so to deal with the budget deficit, which was, nearly, which was just on 5% of GDP, they believed we had to find extra tax revenue. You couldn't find it out of the personal tax rates, they were really too high. So it had to come out of consumption. And in fact, you were wanting to cut the, the personal <coughs> yeah, rates. Yeah, that's right. So we wanted to cut the personal tax rates, they were too high. Um, and so we came to the conclusion they're probably right. That is, we can't deal with the legacy of the last Fraser budget and the spending in the 70s without some new base in taxation. And the obvious one was a tax in consumption. And, and if you were cutting taxes in some areas, yeah. unless you were going to bleed your revenue, yeah. you had to find taxes. We had others. to buy, broaden the tax base. That's what we had to do, cut out corporate, corporate concessions, and personal concessions like fringe benefits, tax fringe benefits where they were untaxed, you know, motor cars, free meals, credit cards, all that sort of thing. Um, but Bob and I had never agreed actually to have a, a, a big tax package 
What had happened was this debate had overtaken us. That's what happened. It was essentially writing, rewriting a, a new tax system in five months. That's what it meant to. What toll was taken? Oh, it was just ginormous. I mean, I mean, officers were keeping having their children in to the to the, the tax summit area, you know, the cafeteria. Kids sleeping on on on, on mattresses under their under their desks. I mean, this went on. I mean, the effort the department put in was phenomenal, for absolutely phenomenal. It broke, it broke a lot of people. It was so, I mean, it was so bad. It was such, a, it was such an effort, you know. That tax summit debate was the biggest debate I'd ever had until 1990 in telephones. It was the biggest debate I'd ever had in the cabinet. And I would think a lot of people would have been understandably concerned about the political implications, hmm. and then also because it was fundamentally seen as a uh, regressive tax, hmm. an unfair tax on lower income people. Yeah. Uh, that as Labor ministers, a number of them were concerned about that too, weren't they? Yeah, but it, was a one, it wasn't a value-added tax like the GST. It was a one-levied retail-level tax, but for which I was offering massive overcompensation for people in the lower decibels of income. The ACTU knew that and, and the welfare lobby knew that. And if they'd have had a ton of sense, they would have taken it. It turned out the welfare lobby didn't didn't finally embrace that until John Howard became Prime Minister nearly a decade later. Uh, so they, they rejected the offer of a lifetime uh, in rejecting the overcompensation which I had offered them to bring in the consumption tax. So how hard was it to get Cabinet on side to that option and uh, to what extent did you rely on Bob Hawke to assist you getting that through? I had him in the cart. Then out, remember the tax cart? I had him in the cart, then he'd go out of the cart. Then he'd go in the cart, then he'd go out of the cart. Because a lot of this was a hangover of his problems he'd had from 1984. You know, I mean, Bob was in no great shape to have this fight in the Cabinet room. And, and, it, and again, again, in mm, fairness to him, he yeah. would say that wasn't the case and yeah. he's not here. Yeah. No, no he, can, he, could say, he could say what he likes. But in the end, his staffer, Ross Garno, sat in his place in the Cabinet room arguing the case against the consumption tax. Do I have to say any more? I mean, and, and finally, after three days in the meeting, Stuart West said, Paul, I don't think you have a majority here for your package. And I said, Stuart, yes, but do you have a majority to stop me walking out the door with a decision? Meaning? I was, there was a cabinet decision. I was saying the cabinet had agreed to it. Bob didn't want to put it to a vote. West said, I don't think we have a majority for your submission. I said, yes, but do you have a majority to stop me walking out the door? And when I walked out with the Treasury officers who were with me, Ted Evans, David Morgan, Greg Smith, and Tony, and, um, and uh, Greg Smith and uh, Ken Henry, Ted said, God, that was the toughest meeting I've ever been in. It was the toughest meeting I've ever been in. Now, the political historian and journalist Paul Kelly has written in his book, The End of Certainty, that you prevailed in Cabinet because you put your position as Treasurer on the line yeah. and that Hawke wasn't prepared to cut the ground from under you. Basically, Bob was for the consumption tax. His instincts were to have it there. Right? The same as my own. See, Bob and I, you gotta, you gotta, we are trying to move the country forward uh, on these big aggregates, these big changes, but we have different views of what the traffic will bear, right? Um, just that um, uh, it, it, you know, it, it was a very tough debate, and in the end, at the, cons at the tax summit, Bob did the deal with the ACTU without telling me. He dumped me without telling me. So why did you allow yourself then to become so passionately caught up with the consumption tax? You all but staked your career on it. Well, because I thought the chances of getting the Cabinet at that stage, through two budgets, to cut five or six percent of GDP out of outlays was pretty low. So therefore, and that was your other choice. Yeah, we take. You either need this revenue yeah, from a consumption tax, or or take the longhand route of, of cutting spending. Serious cutting in spending. Yeah. 
which later we did over five years. But it but, took five years. But then when the consumption tax fell at its first hurdle, you just abandoned it. Yeah, because it was not go it was it. I mean, Bob had drawn the line under it. Bob was a Prime Minister. You know, he announces this at the tax summit. He'd drawn the line under it. But, uh, I mean, you then abandoned it forever after. You know, well, when, the, when the other side talked about bringing in their GST, you know, you, yeah. you attacked it with a fury. I did. Let me tell you why. Because those lazy Liberals had spent all the money... Again, they're not here to defend themselves, in, are they? Yeah, but OK, but let's make it clear. Outlays were 30.5% of GDP when John Howard left office, right? A, a if, significant if you, contributor to that was the Whitlam well, Right. If you, t you take the Whitlam and Fra Fraser years, they got to 30.5% of GDP, right? After the terms of trade collapse in '86, I then embarked upon, with the Expenditure Review Committee, a five-year program to bring outlays back to 24% of GDP. Five years. After that, we didn't need the consumption tax. Okay, you I'm, see, I'm, after I'm familiar that, with the argument. Yeah, I know, but I after that, <laughs> after that, all you're doing then is, is if, if you put the consumption tax in, you're just giving the Commonwealth government, the spending ministries, more money to spend. Hmm. And, and if you're going to spend five years cutting spending, why would you then throw them the money through a consumption tax? Is it true, as Paul <laughs> Kelly wrote, that you called Hawke old jellyback no, for his, Peter, lack, that, of, for no, his lack of nerve in that No, theory. that was Peter Walsh, not me. But uh, I've called Bob plenty of things, but old jellyback was not one of them. <laughs> but even if you did it coin it, didn't coin it, did you ever use the no, expression no, yourself no, or, no, or no. did you express a similar no, it would No, no, it was too... It was too too deprecatory of Bob's values and positions. I'd never use a phrase ever. Never have ever since. Kelly again, quote, Keating was unable to conceal his patronising attitude towards Hawke, made manifest in repeated private references to having to get Hawke back into the tax cart. Oh, that's true. That rings a little true. That's true. Yeah. That's completely true. Yeah. Patronising attitude. Well, if someone leaves... This is, you've got to know about power. Kerry, leave a void and someone will fill it. Bob left a massive depression in the power equation through 85, 86 and 87 and a very large measure I filled it. I Quite don't know that there's anyone who actually agrees with you that the depression lasted that long. Oh, I'm not talking about the depression, I'm talking about Bob's, the, the fact that Bob ended up in, in, in a sort of, you know, off the game for such a long period of time. Look, look, look not, not just me saying it. Here is 13 April 1985. Can Michelle Grattan, Hawke struggles to counter a creeping lack of confidence. Here's Paul Kelly, May 1985. Is the job becoming too much for Hawke? But look, the most important perhaps point is by, is, is a piece written by Bob's, Bob Hawke's now wife, Blanche Del Perge, in the same month in May 85, a two-part series for the Herald and the Age, and it says, Bob Hawke, a stunning change. It says, Blanche Del Perge wrote, uh, wrote her biography. Now revisiting him, she finds he is in fine physical form, yet lacking in vitality, that he is vanishing. She says in the two-hour interview, the atmosphere felt like lead. However, observing a man so withdrawn into himself that he apparently did not care whether I listened to him or not, there was a tremendous change to be seen that day, but it was more subtle than dullness. My overwhelming impression was of a lack of vitality that he was vanishing. I thought Hawke seemed chronically fatigued, she says, and then she goes on to say, uh, going to talk to him for the first time in three years, I expected the old zing and was taken aback by its absence, an absence that seemed poignant and shocking. Now, you see, I'm, I'm not putting words in Blanche Del Perge's mouth. I mean, that's how Bob was. I mean, it wasn't just me. It was just obvious. It was obvious. You know, you know the old say, give a dog a bone, they'll bury it. You leave a hole, someone will fill it. Mm. You know, so in that cabinet discussion, uh, I mean, in the end, look, I don't blame Bob for skipping out on the consumption tax. It was a tough ask. What I blame, I blame him for this though, not telling me before he decided to go to the ACTU. In let the middle of the night, right? Let me put that's an alternative. Called, that's called ratting, R-A-T-T-I-N-G. Let me put an alternative proposition as to why he did. 
that Bob Hawke was reflecting broad-based and genuine fears inside the Labor movement that the risks of losing the next election were too great yeah. and that in the end he exercised his prerogative as leader based on that judgment. Yeah, I think, I think his nerves went basically. And I, I told you earlier, Kerry, I worked on the road runner principle, a momentum play. You run hard enough and fast enough for a great change, you will get it. Yeah. For a great change, you will get it. And if you look over your shoulder once, you're dead meat. But Kelly writes that Hawke acted out of political necessity and with a sound conscience, that he felt he'd given you every chance, but that your package fell victim to a rare alliance of yeah. business, the ACTU, yeah. and you Labor centre-left, yeah. uh, and left wings, and the welfare lobby. Yeah, uh, Kerry, and broadly, I was prepared to accept that. I mean, uh, what, what, but, but, it, the same Kelly has also written, is the job becoming too much for Hawke? I mean, in the same year. I mean, broadly I accepted that. Where Bob and I fell out mightily was over the final package in September, not the tax summit. The bottom line is that even your mate Bill Kelty at the ACT, your other trade union allies on the Accord wouldn't support you. Wasn't that what really killed the package? It was, but the, the thing that killed the package was the Business Council of Australia. When Bob White got up and said, we won't support options A, B or C, Bill said to me, well, Paul, if the most likely supporters of this a consumption tax and this cast of policy and the, some of the principal beneficiaries, the business community won't support it, why should we? Right? Explain this to me. The unions uh, campaigned against you on the consumption tax at the summit but you went for drinks with them after they'd helped, oh, they loved, after they'd, after they'd helped roll you. Yeah. Uh, and Bill Kelty presented you with Norman Lindsay's uh, book, The Magic Pudding, signed by the entire ACTU executive. Yeah. Yeah. They'd beaten you. But in the process, as was inscribed in the book, you had won their respect and their trust. What was all that about? Well, they knew that in terms of the big reforms and sticking to the Labor movement, they had more change in power resting in my portfolio hands as treasurer than they'd ever had in the whole 20th century. And while they'd had a disagreement with me on the consumption tax, they weren't going to down me, you know, because downing me is costly, you know. If they downed me, I'd down them at some other point, right? So they, you know... You mean tit for tat? Absolutely, you know. Don't get mad, get even. So. Tell, tell me this. That uh, relationship that was developing between you and trade union leaders, I mean, we've talked before about how intensely you battled the left yeah. and how some of those left-wing uh, left wing leaders yeah. or the leaders in the left-wing factions and the unions uh, yeah. in the Labor movement over those earlier years, they were your <laughs> bitter know. enemies. Yeah. And yet with people like Laurie Carmichael, who was a, a member of the Communist Party for a long time, a senior trade union official, you were forging real friendships with a number of these Oh, they, in the end, they were my great supporters. You see, but they were Bill Kelty supporters. You see, Bill's centre-left group in the ACTU became, in the end, my reinforcement too, you see. I mean, look, you've got to let me pay credit again here. So old, yeah, old yeah, uh, divides, yeah. old factional divides, old ideological <laughs> divides were breaking down. Yeah, they were breaking down. Uh, they were breaking down and the left unions could see the delivery coming on these, big, on these big things. They could see the delivery coming through, particularly a return to growth, a return to employment, later superannuation. They could see these big changes and they never saw this in the past. I thought sense. they were more real than, more real about the real world than my colleagues were at the Labor Council in New South Wales. You know, by that stage I'd given up with Bean, you know, I'd given up on them. All those, sort of, uh, they were, you know, all that vanilla policy they followed in Sussex Street, I'd given them up. And this was, this was your home base. Yeah. I, this was the culture you grew I, up in. I gave them it's up. It's the culture that gave they, you your start. They never forgave me for giving them up for the left, the industrial left. But I did. I did for good reasons. And they never understood what you were about in that regard? No, they, and they, they, they didn't like the wage discounting and they didn't like the wage tax trade-offs and they didn't like this and they didn't like, they didn't even like super when we started on the super. But I judged that the lorry car models of this world were more real and saw more value in the whole accord framework 
than my colleagues in Sussex Street. You are clearly a very proud man. How hard was it to pick yourself up from that defeat and throw yourself back into the task of framing a credible alternative tax reform package that you could live with? Well, it was a very tough thing to do, but I did it. I had to start with a cabinet subcommittee about three weeks later and, and then from, from June to September 1985 I worked on the final package which today is still the basis of the current taxation system of Australia. That is, the top marginal rate went from 60 to 49, then 47. The corporate rate went from 49 to 39. Imagine that. I mean, today, governments are flat out cutting one cent, one percentage point out of the corporate rate. I took it from 49 to 39 and full dividend imputation. In other words, removing the classical taxation treatment of company tax by taxing company income once. You know, it was a revolution. And there was fringe benefits tax, that's capital why, gains that's, tax. Yeah, ca it went fringe benefits tax, capital gains tax. And that's why now people, you know, investors today, you know, self-funded retirees, people want their frank dividend. Well, the frank dividend came from that 1985 tax package. Now, who would you say were crucial to you putting that package together and getting that through the cabinet? Uh, the core of the cabinet, the core, John Dawkins, uh, Gareth Evans, Walsh, Button, uh, Blewett, all those guys. Was, was, uh, I think Susan Ryan was still there, all those people. Uh, how easily were you and Bob Hawke able to mend the fracture in your partnership through the rest of 85? Because Edna Carew has written that the summit was indisputably a new, new low point in the relationship. It was, no, the lowest point was the full tax package. Because come September, Bob didn't want to hear about tax reform anymore. He'd had a gut full of it. And here I am, I'm back there with another big package through the cabinet process, right? So to sort of basically do the package in, he sets me up with the full ministry. Now, just remember this. It's hard enough to do a massive tax change with, a, with an informed cabinet of 13 or 14 people. Imagine if you've got to spend three days with 27 ministers, 13 of which have never done any economic policy in their lives. In this case, people like Tom Uren, and I love Tom, but, you know, Arthur Geitzel, uh, Barry Jones, there they are all in there. And, of course, I get in there... And in one conversation, Arthur says to me, uh, but, uh, well, Paul, we agree with you about capital gains, but we don't agree with you about cutting the top personal rate, and we don't agree with you about dividend imputation. And I said, in which case, Arthur, you were getting nothing. Nothing. And he said, what is this, a dictatorship? No, I said, no, it's not, it's a package. You know, it, we, we can only lower the rates of these things if we broaden the base. If you don't want to broaden the base, we can't lower the rates. You know, and they're like this. Anyway, it went on for three days. The one low point in my whole relationship with Bob was that Bob went to Papua New Guinea that weekend and left me with a whole lot. In fact, Gareth Evans had a go at him. I've got a report of it where he says, the tax goes slow, rebounds on the PM. At one stage, there was a sharp exchange between Mr Hawke and the resource minister, Senator Evans, this was in a subsequent cabinet meeting, who complained about the slow pace at which the meeting was proceeding. Senator Evans, a factional ally of Mr Hawke, was worried that the real purpose behind his deliberations was to engineer, uh, was, was, to, was to ensure that, that no tax package was ever finalised. Right? So that's, that's when the game got really savage. Now, Bob rang me. He landed, he landed at uh, Fairburn Airport from Papua New Guinea, rang me on the car phone. Said, Paul, Bobby, I said, yeah, Bob, how'd you go? I said, I got it all through. He said, got it all through? He said, what, to cut the top rate? And the, the, the imputate the lot? I said, I got the roll through because that wasn't the way the plan was supposed to go. You see, he thought the full ministry would basically throw me back into another process. Well, 
Yes, I, again, I mean, yeah. the, the difficulty of this is, again, he's not here. No, no, but here's To the defend himself, the, but no, he, I'm sure if he was no, here, no, but, yeah, but, you would hear a resounding yeah, word. No, well, let me say, he's beaten you to the punch because his wife's written that lousy little book which has all the counterclaims in it. So I'm not doing Bob any injustice here. They can go and read the, the fictional account if they wish, but here's the newspaper. They don't lie. Another biographer, John Edwards, uh, who once worked for you, wrote that, and, and he's talk, we, we're coming now back to the summit, so I guess you'll probably disagree with this too. Uh, Edwards uh, wrote that, quote, it snapped the collegial bond of trust between you and put in its place a harder, more enduring, but wholly mercenary relationship of mutual advantage. No, it wasn't mercenary. Now look, you've got to understand in all this, because Kerry, you're going to bits of where Bob and I are at odds with our, Bob and I still had Despite this, I mean, the low point is the September tax package, which he takes off to PNG and leaves me with, with the full ministry, 27, to get through the most sophisticated package in Australian history. And it's still the Australian tax system, right? But for all that, the show must go on. We are in show business. The show must go on. And, and Bob stuck to me on most every other thing, and I always had... A, there was always a point of affection for Bob with me. And I mean that. I'm not, yeah. I, I mean real affection for Bob with me. And in the end, in the end, I was a soft touch for him and he was a soft touch for me. And yet, uh, uh, I'm not, um, I mean, that's compelling the way you put it. But there are all these other signposts to the downside of yeah, that. Yeah, but it's called national progress. You've got to elbow your way through the system to get the changes. Look, look, Kerry, public life is only about getting the changes. But let me... The system let, runs itself. Let me come back to this. What does it say about what real friendship is left? That there you were in the middle of putting that final tax package together and you're in your office writing angry comments about Bob Hawke on your own personal archive of newspaper files, like, quote, the envious little bastard did everything to destroy it. He did. He, well, did, every, was, he did everything to destroy he, that package. He did. The envious little bastard. Oh, envious. he was. He, I mean, he, it's, he, he, it's, he got, it's vitriolic. He, he got the shocking low points, Bob. But, you know, there was always a better moment with him, you know, uh, and we sort of kept, kept the show rolling. I mean, the public will never understand the value they got out of Hawke and me. I mean, but they may, never, no under, they may never understand it. You know, nearly a decade, eight and a half years we were together. The changes were revolutionary, you know. So, you know, I would kick and shove and gouge and he would sort of do the same. But nevertheless, both of us had our eye on the main chance, the, the greater public good of the place.